issues and we will listen to any comments or requests or anything that you want to um, to continue um. okay let's get started um, for those of you that are new and I will say that we have about 25 percent of our participants are scheduled for um, all of the sessions there was a problem with the link for the February 12th session and that um, that has been corrected on the MANA RBM website um, so if you go to manarbm.com and go under news um, that has the corrected link on it so now you can register for all of the sessions and the one that um, the link was broken uh, broken on is a really important session on source um, source data review so for those of you that um, are um, new, just to give you a little background, uh, MANA RBM, um, our team has been working on the principles of um, RBM and remote trial management for more than 20, or 10 years. Um, I'm a physician, but I have been, my whole career has been on clinical development, um, and so I pretty much had every job there is, and our team has developed this entire process for risk-based monitoring. We've implemented it and we've also done knowledge transfers. So um, what we want to do in these sessions is to give you real actionable idea or advice and things that you can do to change um, the way um, and start to adopt risk-based monitoring. Um, these webinars are designed to teach you kind of the, the to get you started so that you can begin your process of self-training um, and um, hopefully to give you things that whether your organization implements RBM or not you will be able to think about how to look at um, the quality of the study differently regardless of what the, what's going on in your organization so um, and what we're trying to do is build a cadre of trained monitors that can implement RBM um, and we want to enhance clinical trial quality and drive adoption. So the videos that we have, at least the ones from this month, will be available on our YouTube channel, MANA Risk-Based Monitoring. Um, please subscribe, and um, the vid, um, I think most of you have been able to download the, um, the webinar from last week, um, so it's there as well. And if you go to MANA RBM on Google+, um, you can follow us there and, and find out new information, webinars, uh, blog posts, etc. So just a reminder, the goal of the entire program, our whole seven webinar series, um, is to understand risk-based monitoring principles, goals, and how to achieve those goals. And today, our, our, our goal is to um, that you will be able to conduct a risk assessment for a protocol and that you will be able to conduct root cause analysis, risk mitigation, and corrective action for a specific major finding. So we want you to be able to come out of here with some real um, tools to get started. So we're going to start with risk assessment. Now, um, risk assessment actually ha happens at a few different times and by different groups within um, a clinical trial process. So the first place that it happens is before you even finish the, the protocol. So what, what should happen is that you evaluate your design of your trial, all of the aspects of the trial, and identify where you might have risks for the successful completion of your trial and to eliminate as many of those as possible. So um, I have one slide to kind of go over some of those areas, but at, if as a monitor or as a site, and we have a number of people here that are site um, participants, you won't have any effect here, or you may not. Um, so what your place will be will be to develop the processes to identify and manage high-risk areas after the protocol has been completed. And then, as I said, there's a third place, and that's as a study site that you, um, as an individual study site, want to evaluate that protocol and evaluate the risks that um, to your successful completion of that protocol um, as well. So we think about identifying risks in, in three main places, and we'll talk about each of those today. 
So some of the tools um, are the, as I mentioned, the RACT, Risk Assessment and Categorization Tool by Transcelerate. And it's a um, very good tool if you want to start it. At, it does it by asking a number of questions so that those can help you kind of, uh, and they're in the areas that are going to affect, um, that are going to be your high risk areas. The thing I don't like about the RACT is that it only goes to the point of risk identification and part of um, the most important part of that process I think is to think about how are you going to identify that risk so do you need new data fields that need to be collected do you have new reports that you need so to me that's one of the weaknesses but I think it's a very good start and a great and it's free and I've given it to you so you can download it there's another company called QI Path which has a really nice risk assessment tool um, that, that I like and one of the things I like about it is it allows you to go down even to potential root cause analysis which is a nice piece if you're in management and you're wanting to help monitors at the site to figure out what kinds of things you should look for under root cause although I think um, most monitors um, are very familiar with what what potentially could go wrong it's just been a to me it's part of it's been the way we've been doing our clinical trial process there are other companies I've seen that have advertised um, tools and I have to say I haven't used any of those but then don't forget you can use good old Microsoft Excel and Word and I'm going to show you you know kind of the process of going through the risk assessment quantification and you could set up your own little tool and your own little form um, to do this, not little form, form um, to do this. So each of these um, are, are an option for you and you can look at that um, uh, as you're going forward. But I did want to let you know about those. Now let's look at um, risk assessment and mitigation. So at the protocol level, some of the areas, and again, this is because we have a lot of people with a lot of different um, backgrounds here, but at the protocol level, some of the areas that will affect risk include the subject population, the, you know, what is the plan for recruitment? So, um, for instance, do you recruit a bunch of subjects with a, with a disease and um, they stay in the study until they get an outbreak of the disease? Is this a study that is newly diagnosed patients or even more complicated newly diagnosed pediatric patients all of these kinds of aspects have to be part of your thinking about where the risks are sometimes it could be as complicated as this subject is is a, it's a hospital study and the subject is going to have to be enrolled by one um, specialist and then seen by another specialist and followed up perhaps by a third specialist so all of these aspects you want to think about because as much risk as you can eliminate you want to so also um, oftentimes people will say that um, the number of sub studies is another important area so remember if you have more sub studies that means um, more things that you may have to amend it means that there are more consents all of these aspects um, need to, will include the complexity of the study. Things like timing windows. So how tight do the timing windows need to be? Um, are they critical or not? If you're doing a pharmacokinetic study, then those timing windows are really important. If you are just collecting a, a, a um, blood sample for population pharmacokinetics, not so much. So you want to think about what, if in, as you're designing the trial, what kinds of things are important. Um, whether you're going to collect the data in paper, whether it's going to be in elect, different electronic systems. Are you going to have a separate system for the EPRO, patient reported outcomes, and for the data collection. So all of these things will, will play a role. Are you going to count on, for safety, are you going to count on local labs? In fact, and that is if that's the case, how are those data going to get entered in? How are you going to check those? Is it going to be central labs? Is it, you know, how are you going to assess um, the investigator um, uh, um, assessment of clinical significance? So 
All of these kinds of things in the protocol design are really important and will affect the risk. So now you got now we're at what the monitor does and the clinical ops folks do, and that now you're going to identify the potential risks in critical areas. So I'm going to say this probably every single time that we have a, a webinar on this, and the but it'll help you to kind of put this in your mind. As we said, not all data are created equal. So we want to focus on subject safety, protocol compliance, because the risk to the subject is based on a specific protocol. So if people go, investigators go, quote unquote, off the reservation and start not following the protocol, then the assessment of the risk to the um, study subject is not the same. So it's important to realize that protocol compliance is absolutely critical investigational product, good clinical practice, and efficacy measures because you want to make sure we're doing the study to be sure um, to measure these efficacy measures um, in most situations. Sometimes they're just safety studies, but we want to make sure that when we get done with the study that we have the information we need because if you have a study that doesn't complete, then you've put patients at risk for no value. So part of the value is to advance science and to be able to understand this. So now we're going to go into a little more detail on this. So let's just take one of those areas and that's investigational products. So I think a lot of times um, we this area um, has some gets limited and so I want to spend some time. So some of the things you want to think about and as a monitor, this is why you want to read the protocol carefully. You want to read the investigation investigator brochure carefully because in there, they'll talk about specific um, properties of the molecule and also properties of the class of molecules. So if we look at NSAIDs um, for, for pain and for osteoarthritis and the fact that NSAIDs um, depending on the type, have um, some cardiovascular risk. The same way with SSRIs for um, so um, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. There are risks around, in, you know, if you rapidly discontinue or or discontinue without tapering. There are risks um, that are on the labels around. Um, adolescent subjects and potential risk of suicide. So you want to understand these because these are going to be important in your risk assessment. And how are you going to identify these? Also data from preclinical and from trials. So what are you what do you learn from the most common adverse events, the most common serious adverse events? Because those are all going to be important as part of your safety assessment. Um, let labeling and packaging and shipping. So is this a drug or a device that has to be shipped um, across um, country lines? Are you going to have to worry with customs? Are you going to have to worry about, um, you know, what do you need to know about receipt and storage? So where is that drug, uh, drug or device, that IP going to be received? How are you going to document that? Is there a way that, that, can, that you can review that? Same way with storage, especially if there are special storage requirements. Um, and then dosing is a big area. So is this a drug or a device that has to be escalated in the way it's used? Is it um, a product that is, is administered IV or is this a product that is, um, is inserted be, um, through surgery? All of these kinds of aspects of dosing and administration of that product are really important. Same way with compliance. How are you going to assess compliance? And finally, destruction, because this is a very, very important part of the, the trial, and you want to be thinking about each of these, and can you identify risks associated with those? So let's take some examples, because it's much more fun if we don't just look at lists, but think about it. So. I gave you, here's an example. So this is a, um, a drug, or a, a drug, an IP pain medication um, that is um, a new pain medication, okay? 
So that some of the potential risks that you might put in yours are that the investigational product may be diverted at the clinic. So we know that um, if this is a, a new pain medication um, and we know about all of the problems with opioids and let's just say it is an opioid, then you have to be very careful about any kind of, of investigational product diversion. So this is going to be important from a study monitoring standpoint. From a site stand, a subject standpoint, they may take that um, investigational product. Let's just say it's going to be one not administered in the clinic, or in the clinic, but it's going to you're going to send it home with the research subjects, and it could be diverted. So you want to think about different kinds of potential risks based on, again, this is a specific class of products. Here's another one. Let's just say this is an investigational product that must be dosed based on body surface area. So um, there's some potential risks here. So what would happen if the site miscalculates the body surface area? So you have to have height and weight to be able to do the body surface area. And so again, you want to make sure. What if the site um, is able to get the um, get the randomization but hasn't entered the height and weight. So you can't actually do the calculation on the body surface area because you don't have the information in there that you need. So again, um, these are potential risks and again, this is the first step. You want to identify these potential risks. Now, a lot of people feel that this takes a long time and it does, but as I mentioned before, you don't find what you don't look for. So the time spent thinking about this will really help you in it and we'll continue to go through how as we move forward. Here's another one. Let's just say this is an investigational product that must be administered um, by a specifically trained staff. And this is um, an example that I saw out of a device trial. So um, some of the risks could be that um, the wrong staff may administer the IP. So one of the questions is how would you know that? The second would be that the person that is trained to administer the IP may not be available. What's to happen then? So all of these are, again, by putting these and thinking about these, then you can start to put plans in place. Now, um, at the last webinar, um, I talked a little bit about, you know, why did the FDA put this area of risk-based monitoring into place. And um, this is from that presentation that was given by Jonathan Helfgott, who at the time was with the FDA in the, their um, inspection group. Um, in the, it was a, a CBI conference that was uh, November 2014. So in this example, this was the example out of um, uh, where the dosing for the pediatric patients was um, the, the subjects were overdosed. And this was an example of a dosing instruction that was sent to the site, which one was sent late and clearly you can see is very confusing. I wouldn't know what to do here. And um, so what this is showing is that one, if the risk is that the dosing is very complicated, okay, then what you want to be able to do is you want to provide tools that really help with that and you want to make sure those tools are available immediately and they've been tested. And again, the idea here is for you to realize when you have a risk such as we're going to have complicated dosing instructions, then you want to be thinking about how are you going to address those. Let's think about efficacy. So I'm not going to go through each of the areas of risk just because we don't have enough time. But I want to talk to you about, so let's just look at the efficacy measures. So how are they going to be collected? Is it going to be a patient reported outcome? Is it a rating scale? Is it a combination, combination of both a patient scale plus the rating scale from the investigator? Um, when are the assessments collected? You know, are there very tight timelines when those assessments need to be done? Um, I mentioned